Welcome to episode 3 of Distillery Sessions. In this episode, we'll hear from three industry leaders discussing marketing beyond today's climate and how brands can build meaningful connections. Leading the discussion today is Simon Hearn, Distillery's Group Director in Singapore. Today we'll look at what brands have been doing to shift their strategies over the past few months. Um, how are brands used emotion, empathy, um, and offered a helping hand to support their audience? What trends are we seeing now that, that we can learn from that might help us in the medium to long term? And what will the new normal be for society? And how as marketeers will we communicate plans, um, commu our communication plans need to evolve? So um, I'm not going to be talking uh, <laughs> talking too much on this. I'll be leading the questions, but um, we pulled in three industry experts to help provide their insight and advice on this um, at this time in the current and the future state of our industry. So we've got a nice mix um, here. We've got uh, representing, I guess, the brand side, dialing in from Australia. We've got George Ween from Coke. Uh, from the agency side and giving that perspective, we've got Dick Van Motman, who was the former, former global CEO for content and creative at Dentsu Ages Network. Um, and he's dialing in from Singapore. And then we've got Ferdy, who's dialing in from Bangkok. Ferdy is the, the co-founder and CEO at Ampverst, who, um, for those who haven't heard of Ampverst, are uh, an esport and gaming specialist agency. They kind of act as a bit of a hybrid across everything on, on the esports and gaming side, whether it be media, the rights, influencers, and partnerships. Um, these guys will introduce themselves properly in just a moment, but um, you know, a huge thank you to them in advance for, for giving up their time today and, and imparting their wisdom on us. I might just start with you, George, um, to, to kick us off. Just quickly kind of keen for you to introduce yourself and perhaps tell us a brand that you've seen um, during, you know, over the last few months that's caught your attention that you think has been doing, has, has reacted well to the COVID situation. Well, thanks, Simon, and uh, good afternoon or good evening to everybody on the on call. Um, yes, my name's George Ween, so I work, in, uh, work for Coke in their marketing team. Over the last uh, 20 years or so, I've been working in uh, various brand marketing jobs for food and beverages companies around Southeast Asia, Europe, and uh, more recently in Australia, and I've worked on brands like uh, the Coca-Cola brand, Schweppes, Digestives, McVitie's, Jaffa Cakes, Schweppes, Fanta Sprite, Powerade, and a, and a bunch of uh, different energy drink brands. So, um, it's, uh, not surprisingly, during the the COVID crisis, my you know, my attention has been focused on what other consumer goods uh, brands have been doing. And um, one thing that I haven't necessarily been in, impressed by is some of the some brands which have suddenly transformed themselves miraculously into empathetic brands o overnight and have promised me that they're here to help and are going to stand by me through, uh, through, through thick and thin. Um, but where I have been uh, impressed is by the number of brands that have been able to stay true to what their brand purpose is uh, and pivot and develop creative in a, you know, a very rapid period of time that really connect with the mindset the consumers have found themselves in. And that's my favourite um, favorite brand campaign over the last uh, over the last month or so has been Budweiser's repurposing of their What's Up campaign. And so maybe I'm you know showing my age here, but that was an iconic, memorable, bloody funny commercial that was released probably 15, 20 years ago. And the way that they quickly changed the changed the voiceover to repurpose it for a, a public health message, a hashtag together a difference was I thought was was genius um, and they did it in a way which elicited a really strong emotional response made it memorable uh, and therefore was was attention grabbing awesome yeah I completely agree I think that, you know it's a great example um, Ferdy same question to you a um, little introduction and, and the brand that's caught your attention yeah hi uh, hi everybody my name is Ferdy I um, I've actually I'm a little bit of a hybrid as well um, I grew up in the States, but I've been working in Southeast Asia for a long time. I, I actually, my career is really based 20 years in advertising as well. I used to be the ex-CEO of Havas Media here in Thailand. I used to run uh, Neo at Ogilvy in, in Singapore. So those are, come, I've been in the industry for about 20 years. But in the meantime, I also built the gaming startup in 2010, which had about 5 million users and a million daily users. And I sold that over a couple of years. 
um, always loved the gaming space. I always thought that, you know, there was a real uh, gap in the market for really good gaming companies in this region. So I, I, I built my own. Um, I, after advertising, I worked at Twitch for a year and a half or so, working on all the marketing initiatives for Twitch and um, realized how big an opportunity there was again and got the itch to do it again and build another startup and here I am. Uh, so, you know, as you said before, you know, Ampverse is a, is a gaming company that encompasses everything from content all the way up to owning esports teams. Um, it's always been a dream of mine to, to, to own a, a, a sports team because I'm so passionate about sports. And um, being able to do that in the esports and gaming field has been really fun. Um, one of the brands that I love is, of course, is Nike because I'm a sports guy. And obviously what they've been doing is, you know, giving sneakers away to the hospital staffs, et cetera. You know, anything that's in, you know, another brand that's done really cool stuff is uh, Undefeated. I like underground brands. They've also been giving out masks for everybody with, with the branding, whoever buys it. They give two or three to, to hospitals or, or people who need it. So I, I quite like it. anything that gives back at this time, especially all the cool brands that I like, you know. Cool. Thank you. Oh, I will be diving into a little bit around the esports space um, shortly. Uh, Dick, last but no means least, over to you. Thank you, guys. Um, and thanks, uh, George, for taking my, uh, <laughs> for the brand that I wanted to, uh, to list, um, which is actually very quite dear to my, to my heart, given my DDB uh, heritage. And I was actually a DDB when that campaign ran. So not that I had anything to do with it, but what, it was always great to show uh, the work at that point of time. Um, yeah, um, Simon, as you said, I've uh, been the outgoing or your former CEO of uh, uh, Dance Regis Network for uh, Global Creative and Content. Um, I've been, uh, in a way, fortunate enough to already decelerate since last fall. I'm still in my garden leaf. Um, since last fall and kind of naturally prepared myself for a different state of mind when COVID uh, came, or came around. Um, I... Um, you know, I, I, I'm busy now with setting up some new ventures. I'm going to work much more in the transformation space because um, when I looked uh, back at especially the last 15 years, what I've done when I, uh, you know, working in China, joining Denso seven years ago, first, first uh, foreigner in Asia um, to, to lead Denso, um, I kind of, uh, kind of discovered that transformation and not digital transformation uh, because I think that's actually a cop-out. Transformation is something much more, um, uh, you know, much more succinct and much more essential than, than, than just digital. Um, so I'm focused, going to focus on that, and uh, in due time, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to, tell you, uh, to tell you more about it, but it will be very much in the investment and the advisory space. So, um, so that's, um, that's a bit about, you know, my background. And by the way, being, 20, being in Asia for 25 years, I've seen my fair shares of crises, you know, uh, all the way from Korea, having lived in Korea, Indonesia, Hong Kong, China, SARS, financial crisis, etc. But of course, this is unprecedented. Um, but I think it's also um, actually highlighting a lot of things that, that were essential. And um, we'll get back to that later on when I talk about an economist article. Um, the campaign that uh, Caught, my, caught me was, um, of course, uh, what's up from Budweiser. But I think um, there's also been some interesting small stuff. I actually, there's a very nice restaurant here in Singapore called Nuri. It's a Michelin star restaurant. And they pivoted very early and they started, at the onset, they started to go and like, bring the chef to your house. Then when they started to learn that the circuit break or the lockdown would be much more uh, stringent, they pivoted to delivery and said, okay, you know, we use these type of vendors for our, for our vegetables, for our drinks, etc., etc. Now we make them available to you, which I thought was very beautiful because it is something that were, they were pivoting from a form factor, which was a restaurant, to a value factor, which is enjoyment of food and, you know, gourmet. So that's for me, is a small brand that I like, and then I like on a, on a big scale. I like what Edward Bell is doing at Cathay Pacific. You know, very interesting, small 
good work, very topical. You'll find when you talked about contextual, I think it's great, you know, not pushing the airline necessarily, really, but staying true to the, uh, true to the, uh, the brand premise. They did that very well together with, they were the first airlines to say, we're going to renew your status in 2021. And that's like, okay, clear. Because I also think that one essential element is to take care of the customers you have. And we'll come back to that later. Oh, um, no, some good examples there. I think, Dick, I'll stick with you um, on that and around you know, the brands who stay true to their purpose or have slightly pivoted in what they're doing. Um, you know, we've seen a big trend in in empathy and, and this helpful and supportive messaging and, and action as well. <clears throat> in terms of you know, those brands that have stood up and you know, s joined the conversation and sometimes even led the conversation, what do, you, um, what do you think the kind of the benefits are for those versus the brands that have perhaps gone quiet during this period and decided to pull marketing spend and, and not really say anything at all? Well, you know, I think um, I, it's always difficult. It's very, no, it's very easy to have a judgment about things, correct? And so there are brands that have gone quiet for a good reason. I hope then just that those brands have not gone quiet and said like, okay, I'm going to spend, I'm going to uh, save money, but that they are going to repurpose their marketing spend um, their marketing staff on uh, becoming purposeful and not purpose-led, but purposeful. And we're all talking about brand experiences. And so now is the time to show that you understand your consumers, that you understand time, because we all know brands live in a world. Well, this is the time to show it, that you understand the world, you understand what your consumers are going through. And then give them the experiences they, they, they need. And that can come down to what I think is very simple, basic stuff. Uh, for instance, look at the loading time of your website. Look at the e-commerce experience. Look at the number of people that have, that have come to your site and, and, and you can't serve them because you're out of stock. Do you capture their data? Do you retarget them? This is, these are very simple things to show that you that you're doing customer experiences as against to the big lofty statements yeah because i can show you a real i've got a real here of 30 40 brands that have this you know we're here with you well these are the times to show show me that you're with me yeah and what you know the, those brands that are playing in that space of of being with you and being with us as as um you know consumers what what do you think that long-term benefit is in, in playing in more of the brand space now, as opposed to, you know, pushing sales or sticking to their original strategies? Yeah, I think um, now's the time to look uh, hard back to that Economist article. Um, for those who haven't read it, go online. I'm, I was not a big fan of the Economist in the last couple of years. I thought it was uh, fading a little bit, but there's an article that basically the underlying premise is that what COVID shows is basically is that the changes that are now happening are changes that were already in the making or should be accelerated. So in our industry is the interplay between data, creativity, the ability to serve up contextual, and I think contextual is enormously important, contextual messages um, at scale and speed. Um, I think, you know, that's important. And so, um, now is the time to show whether you have muscle memory, and that's why I talk about transformation and all digital transformation, whether you have building muscle memory within the company in order to change, in order to pivot and to think in terms of value and not form. Uh, uh, everything that gets disrupted previously or now are things that think in terms of form. And it's very human, it's very normal because form is something you hold on to. Form factors are something that you, was used in the past to build big businesses and brands because of capex spends and all that. But now it's all about how do I deliver best value? What kind of what kind of capabilities? What kind of technology um, do I select or deselect and serve up a better customer experience? So I think it's the ability of co the companies that can do that. 
and that can really have a very sharp point of view of what is happening, what they stand for, and translate that into a relevant experience. Yeah, no, I think you're completely right there. And George, coming over to you, I guess on the brand side, um, you know, you, you mentioned purpose and staying true to what the brand stands for. Um, I think for those who didn't see it, there was a, an article back in March that Coke were going to come off air in Q2 to mitigate the impact of the F&B industry shutting down. Um, how have, how have Coke, uh, Coke's marketing activities changed uh, as a result of the COVID crisis? I think one of the things that um, we've been trying to do is to is understand the, what the consumer mindset is or is likely to be over the different uh, phases of the, of the crisis and thereby adjust our marketing activities so that they're going to connect with consumers, the, consumer, the, the relevant consumer mindset at the different, uh, during the different phases. Um, the other thing that we've been really guided by is um, is, our, is our company purpose, which uh, purpose, which both uh, I mean Dick and Fernando have been me mentioning, which in our, our company purpose is to refresh the world and make a difference, to make a positive difference within each of the communities that we operate in. And really, in the in the in the first phase of of the crisis, at the onset of the, the COVID uh, COVID nineteen pan pandemic, when fear was at its peak, we decided. That, that our role was really to try and make a difference. And we wanted to do more than, more than say. And as a result, we, we paused our advertising and we focused our efforts on uh, redeploying our resources in supporting the local, uh, local communities as, as best as we could. And I think during this period, we've invested about $100 million in supporting local communities that deal with some of the effects of the crisis and support people during that. But as we've been going through the first phase, we've been looking at what the what the second phase is, the re recovery phase, and um, we've been predicting, and it looks like it's uh, it's transpiring that you know that, that, that consumers are, while still concerned about the pandemic, are looking at it in a more you know calm way, a bit more hopeful and optimistic about the future, and therefore our approach over the last few weeks in different markets across Asia Pacific has been to has been to try and inspire people and talk about uh, a better us. And we've just released some content, which you may have seen, and you can on the call can I can Google after this called the, the human race. Uh, and at, at the heart of that is a message of of optimism and hope, and really celebrates the humanity and generosity of spirit that we've seen in communities across the world during in, in times of uh, adversity. Um, now, whilst you know, in most markets around the world, we're in, fortunately, we're in the recovery phase. Now looking at, you know, what the next phase will be, which is, you know, we're calling and many others are calling the, the new normal. And, you know, developing our marketing activities to reflect, you know, what, what new possibilities that, that the crisis, coming out of the crisis will, will present everybody. And how can we look at this with a, you know, the, the sort of trademark Coke glass half full approach. So, so really what we've been doing is trying to adjust our marketing activities to what we think that the consumer mindset is likely to be um, as, 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 the, as the, the crisis um, runs its course. Yeah, and I think Coke have, you know, have always put human emotion and that connection at the heart of their advertising, you know, the, the sharing and happiness. Um, I guess uh, the glass half full, as you said, uh, are the words that spring to mind. Um, why Coke have been doing this for a long time. Obviously, now a lot more brands, I guess, uh, are adapting to bring in that emotive level. What, why has it always worked for Coke? Why, why have you always played in that emotional connection space? Um, well, I mean, I think the, the I mean, the Coke product has has always been an uplifting and refreshing. Over the, I don't know what it is, 130, 138 years of of, of marketing activity that's gone behind the brand. Um, the brand has become embedded with really rich emotions like positivity, happiness, optimism, and, and also togetherness and, and inclusivity. And one of the things that I think you know, the Coke company has, has learned over decades of developing a highly emotional advertising, running them in many markets in the world, evaluating them, tracking them, is that, um, that emotional advertising is, you know, create, is, is remembered much more effectively. And 
uh, and, and therefore has a, is great, far more effective at changing purchase and positive amongst, amongst consumers. I think there have been a number of studies which have come out over the last four or five years which have, which have shown this, that you know, have empirically proved that the highly emotive advertising, whether it you know, evokes happiness, um, you know, uh, hilarity, pride, nostalgia, inspiration, is three times more likely to be remembered than advertising which has low emotional appeal. So you know, emotional advertising is proven to be effective. And um, what I like to think about it is, you might, you know, you, people may not remember what you say, but they will remember how you make them feel. So again, taking it into a consumer goods perspective, if, if, I, if a consumer is standing in front of a you know, supermarket fixture looking at an array of different competitor brands, and one of them, say Coke brand, has made them feel positive or good, far more likely to, you know, that emotion is likely to nudge them in the direction of choosing, uh, you know, of choosing that product. So I think, you know, in terms of, you know, what can other brands learn about, you know, the way that Coke has gone about it, I, I think I'd really encourage people to understand what the emotional benefit of your brand is or what it, what it can be. And then constantly in all touch points of your marketing programs, trying to evoke that evoke that emotions among amongst consumers. Okay, oh, really good answers. Um, Ferdy, I'm going to come to you now and, and just dive into a little bit of esports. Um, sure. You know, COVID has, has certainly put most sports on the back burner. Most sports have, have been postponed. Like, you know, the, the Bundesliga made a return on the weekend, but otherwise mm -hmm. the, the traditional sports have been pretty quiet, which has meant that it's cleared a bit of a pathway for esports and gaming. Keen to understand from you, you know, what's happening in the esports industry? Has there been a, a big influx of brands wanting to play in this space during COVID? And is there, you know, are you, are you seeing a lot more traction with, with brands here? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think that with, with traditional sports being on hiatus, there is a, a nice window for us in esports. Um, you know, I think there's, there's esports and there's gaming. You know, gaming in general has, has, there's a big uplift anyway. Uh, it's a growing field that, you know, here in, in Southeast Asia, it's about 20 billion hours of gaming uh, content being watched. So I, I, there's an increase of about 40% over in the last month or so in just, in just gaming content. Um, from that perspective, I mean, if you look at the way traditional sports and esports are, are set up, a lot of traditional sports, again, have specific dates in which, you know, in which events are played, right? There's games at a certain time. The things that's happening in esports is the, the offline events are being canceled just like traditional sports. And now a lot of the events are being pushed online. And as a result, a lot of the events that we do is all online based. And a lot of the online based tournaments that we do makes it easier for us to be able to execute while still during these challenging times, right? And a lot of the companies are getting involved is seeing that one, COVID's really forced people to be more digital anyway, right? Because there's nothing else to do. You can't actually physically even play sports if you like to and then any other passion that you have. So being online is, is, is basically giving us a, a boost. And what, what I like to see is a lot of the endemic brands, like let's say the EAs or the, or the you know, Activisions, et cetera, Riot, they're all increasing their spends and they're all because of, you know, they're taking advantage of all the, the, the players playing more um, and, and consuming more content. The non-endemic brands are still slowly starting to get into the space. And the interesting thing is, in general, what gamers or the gaming audience is Gen and Gen Z, right? These guys are the least on TV and they're least on, on, on traditional media. So this focus on digital media has really given us a boost as well. So what, what's happening is, you know, brands that you traditionally don't do anything in gaming and esports are coming in. I'll give you an example. Louis Vuitton is doing stuff with gaming. Right, you think, well, what is a Louis Vuitton doing in gaming, especially uh, sponsoring League of Legends, right? The thing that they're saying is, look, my brand is starting to lose relevance with Gen Z audiences. 
And what they're trying to say is I need to reconnect. And this whole audience doesn't connect on TV. So having them connect via gaming is one way for them to get younger and be more relevant again, because they're thinking, I got to protect my, 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 my customers of the future. And if they don't care about me and Supreme and other underground brands are coming up there and saying, look, I'm also getting, you know, a share of my wallet. How do I stay relevant? So that's a big deal, right? You see those guys, BMW just sponsored a bunch of esports teams. And it's the same thing. It's like you think gamers don't have this kind of money. Actually, gamers are like the new rock stars out there. Gamers are, you know, if you look at games, uh, teams like FaZe Clan, for example, they're not just playing games, they're cultural icons now. You're talking about people with billions of views on Facebook or on YouTube, etc., And they have real influence because what, one thing that the gamers have is they have a strong sense of community unlike any other community I've ever seen. And I've been in advertising a long time. And these guys really kind of cling on to the messages and they, they, they're, they're more about people. And, and if you can use uh, gamers and the influencers that we have or the esports teams that we have effectively, brands can make a lot of differences in, in changing the mindsets of, of future consumers. So the, <clears throat> I think you, you know, my experience with esports is they are, an audience that do love what they do and they, they don't trust brands who are just trying to jump on the bandwagon. Um, you know, they want the endemics obviously play a natural role, but for a brand like Louis Vuitton coming into the, you know, the esports space, trying to, you know, earn, earn the attention in the right way. How are they doing that? Are they, are they using content? How are they, how are they adding authenticity? How are they adding value? Well, they're in the game, actually. You can see the, the, the trophy in, in there. The trophy is, is designed by Louis Vuitton. Right, you can. Uh, Louis Vuitton actually did a line of, of apparel that's just for gamers or gaming oriented. Um, there's also a lot of other luxury brands jumping into it as well, not just Louis Vuitton. So they're trying to, you know, I think the, the whole thing about the gaming community, they thrive on authenticity. It's got to be real, like you said. If it's not real, this 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 group is so allergic to to anything fake. They'll just turn off right away. That's why they look at brands that say, hey. Um, for example, anything you do with advertising, I like it when a brand says, especially things like on Facebook, for example, if, if you watch a video and afterwards it says, hey, um, this brand's really supporting me as a creator, go ahead and watch this so that you can support me. And anything like you've seen on Twitch where they're supporting the community, um, that, that's the way gamers, that's the, that's the way the community works. They're, they're here to help each other. And I think when you look at gaming as a community, um, it, it is highlighting the humanity of, of the, what the world's going through, to be honest with you. They're a microcosm because they're using digital tools to help each other. So I think, you know, authenticity is, is basically the best way to get to this group. And guys like Louis Vuitton do it well. Yeah, cool. Um, Dick, I'm just going to come back to you on, on um, you know, Ferdy mentioned content and using content there. And, and we've seen you know, with everybody being stuck at home, there's, there's been a huge uh, increase in demand for content. Everybody's craving something to watch uh, and engage with. You know, I think I, I saw a Google report that trends for, oh, YouTube channel, YouTube um, consumption of workout videos were up 500% than, than pre-COVID. And people are watching how-to videos, whether it's cooking or baking sourdough or whatever it is. Um, you know, we're conscious about me mental well-being as well. TikTok, YouTube, all rising. Um, millennials are even coming back to Facebook. Uh, what do you what do you think the kind of trends are around brands getting into this space in content if they haven't done before? How how are you kind of seeing brands play in this space to feed that craving that we've got at the moment and do that authentically? I think um, one thing that you now clearly can see is what uh, what our consumers' passion points right is with that content. All those things that you just mentioned, you know, the videos that they're watching, the celebrities or uh, new, <laughs> new, uh, new to be made celebrities that are coming online that they're gravitating to, it clearly shows you a where the passion points are. And I think from a research point of view, this is phenomenal. So you can really, you can really analyze that very well. I think uh, the way to deal with it as brands is to be very careful on the one hand. 
because as, as, as Freudian just says, authenticity is still key. And um, I think it's not just authenticity, it's also about what do you bring to me? Because I'm now in a content stream which I have very purposely chosen. I'm very passionate about this. And you're going to insert yourself into it. Is that a meaningful insertion? Is that a really, and do you enrich my experience? Um, and, you know, I, I've been toying around with, uh, with the notion of uh, conscious consumerism. I think one of the things that will come out of COVID is much more conscious consumerism. I call it con consumism, but that doesn't really yet uh, stick. So any, 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 uh, any, you know, any suggestions are welcome. But I really think that consumers are much more, will be much more considerate, much more purposeful when they choose their brands going forward. And I do think unconsciously they have a blacklist in their mind building as well. It's like, well, what are you doing for me? Well, where are you? Um, and so I think, you know, that that's one part. And the other part as a, as a brand is to therefore become a channel or a carrier for some of these trends. And so like, you know, have you seen this? Have you, if you know your audiences, you know how to connect your consumers and various passion points. And so rather than obviously being very front and center sales, but being a connector, I think is a really interesting opportunity at this moment when there's so much content being watched and so much content being produced. I think you, you, you touched there on, um, you know, the role of talent and influencers and, and people that are, I guess, are passionate about somebody that they, they follow or they like. Um, and Ferdy, you talked about it as well around that authenticity coming from, you know, the gamers and the esports and it's, you know, hey, these guys back me, watch this piece of content and that adds authenticity. Um, I guess the, the virus has been a, an unbelievable lever, uh, leveler in terms of how we view celebrities. You know, normally on this pedestal, but now they're all stuck at home. They're all looking for things to do. Musicians are playing music in their living room. Celebs are, you know, chatting to fans on Zoom. So we're connecting with them on a, on a, on a much lower level um, and seeing the kind of realism of the celebrities. You know, some brands are doing, uh, are kind of capitalizing this. You know, there's the Adidas home team campaign, um, you know, in Australia, I think Optus have been running a, a great campaign around good day a day to encourage people to talk using celebrities, um, having Zoom calls. Uh, what do you, can you just get your opinion, you know, as, as somebody that uses influencers a lot and, and recommends that for, for brands? What are the role of celebs and, and influencers in the market, in marketing campaigns at the moment? Well, I think in general, there's a difference between celebrities and influencers. I think celebrities are now, the people who have a lot of following, they tend to be more of a brand building type of person. You know, a person like Taylor Swift who has millions of followers, you know, they, they don't necessarily, you know, pe people, they have such a broad audience that it, it's very difficult for them to be a real like influencer. What we see in the gaming space or what we see in the influencer space, the smaller influencers have a much more deep uh, connection to their community. And this is about community, right? The bigger your community is, the more it's just about mass messages. The smaller your community is, the more influence you have. And that's why I think there's a big difference between a celebrity and an influencer. Celebrity may not be the best for a brand unless they're, unless they're, they're trying to build awareness, for example. An influencer is great if they want pockets of people to start doing things, in my opinion. If you say, if I have a, a great influencer in terms of gaming and they use a certain you know, mouse, right? That's really, really effective for them. You know, since they only have, let's say 5,000 users, there's always that two-way communication. They can still really communicate almost on a one-to-one -one basis with these people, right? People with a million, two million, three million followers, it's, it's very difficult to have that same relationship with their community. So I think that from, from that perspective, I think that's the way you have to look at it. The bigger or, or, or the wider the, the celebrity is, it's more about brand building. It's more about building equity around the brand. While if you want to drive more action-based things, download this, buy that, you know, it's great to have these pockets and communities behind you. And you got to get the right ones, right? 
you got to get you got to get the ones who are influencing others to do stuff too. So there's a, a spider web effect to that. Can I build so up on that? Because it's like, you know, George earlier also uh, brought up something about when Coca Cola went, you know, went uh, off air and they actually refocused on the communities and Freddie's point about influencers and, um, and celebrities. I think there's a, another concept emerging, which is proximity. You know, we're all now much more, we, we're brought back to where we live. We brought back to where we work. We're being brought back to our country. Now, some of that you can translate into nationalism. I think a much more positive way of looking at it is actually proximity. You, you know, where you live, where you work, the engagement within that circle is suddenly strengthened much more. And if you widen that further and you see, for instance, the rise of 3D printing, then now there's a lot of rise in, in that. I think you will you will probably see a, a reconfiguration of community, what communities constitute of, and how you interact with those co uh, communities. And that's a very, I think, a very exciting um, uh, point for, for brands and marketeers to look into. Um, you know, how do you, how do you take care of that? Defining, the the, recognizing those communities, connecting those communities and playing a role in that. Uh, completely. I think communities, community is so important at the moment and how you play that role is, is spot on. Um, very conscious of time. We, we've only got probably about 10, 10 or so minutes left. Um, I'm just going to move the conversation on, I guess, before we think about the future, just wanted to check in on, on ROI and, and how brands are likely to measure success at the moment. Um, George, from a brand perspective, you know, with lots of brands, um, you know, talking about empathy and, and being helpful and supportive and um, lending a helping hand. Yeah, I think you mentioned that Coke have put 100 mil plus a, you know, a load of other resource into helping communities. How, how are you measuring success of that? You know, what, what in, in six months time, what does the ROI look like? I mean, I, mean, I think that, I mean, the, the pledges that we've made to local communities, that's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a commitment that we do as part of our communities. We're not looking at a, at an, at an ROI on, on that. But in terms of, I guess, of our ongoing up marketing activities, measuring ROI is, is, really, is really difficult, particularly, say, and again, I'm looking at this from a consumer goods perspective, uh, sales is just so volatile. You've got one channel, which is like grocery, which is doing, doing really well, and you've got others like pubs and clubs and restaurants, which are, are practically zero in terms, of, in terms of sales. So the way that we're looking at evaluating all of our marketing activities is is through is through tracking measures so you know campaign tracking brand tracking understanding how we're uh, how brand perceptions and, and attitudes are, uh, are changing and and how that is linked to to purchase intent so a much softer evaluation of um, the impact of um, of our of our communication campaigns but um really the you know really the, the best that you know, we believe that we're able to do at, at, at the moment. As, as we move through the phases of the, of the, of the crisis, you know, and, and as more and more you know, sales channels for us or uh, marketing channels open up for, for us, we'll be able to evaluate uh, the return on our investment in a much more, um, more, more normalised way. Do you think in, uh, you know, once we've broken the back of COVID, hope we've come out of it, you know, we are unfortunately going to be in a recession and potentially even a depression um, based on where the, where the economy is going at the moment. Is there going to be a lot more pressure from your senior managers and your senior execs to really fight for that bottom line, you know, much more focus on sales and conversion? And do you think you'll be able to get the, the budgets for the, the big brand campaigns when, you know, budgets, the income's much lower and, and there's much more focus on that bottom line? Yeah, I mean, I've, I think I think unless you're in a, a select number of uh, businesses or working on a, a, a on a very short list of brands, you know, we, we're all commercially challenged, and you know, cash is cash is king at at the moment. However, I mean, I think you know the 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 history, at least with the Coca Cola company, is that those brands which invest in a crisis come out better. Those brands which invest behind their brands gain market share. And then in the long term, the return on investment on that investment is multiplied many times from the investment that you make in the normal course of uh, the normal course of investment. So, so that's that's very much our approach is to is to invest. But probably one of the big changes we're focusing on is where 
as we invested across our portfolio from Coke, which is our monolithic brand, through to some of our smaller brands, we're focusing on investing behind the bigger brands because that's where you're able to drive the return of investment, uh, return on investment now. Um, so again, to, to try and directly answer your question, I think there is a strong case that you know, marketing managers, brand managers can make for, for investment, but the, the case has to be a lot tighter and stronger than it perhaps was um, you know, six months ago. And, and, you know, if we look ahead six months, 12 months, 18 months, when, you know, hopefully there's a, we're, we're back to normal or, or whatever the new normal is. Um, question for you, Dick, do you, do you think we're likely to continue to see this emotive, you know, supporting led marketing continue? Um, and, and is there an expectation now from consumers that that's how they want brands to act? Yeah, you know, I always have a, a little bit of a challenge to just label it like emotive versus others. I think it's a combination of, right? And, and when I grew up, one of, the, one of my lessons was that I, I, I work in the business of advertising and not in the advertising business, which means we're helping our clients to build brands and businesses. And you do that with a combination of things. Yeah, and, and there is there, there, there is a role for emotive, there's a role for mass media, but there's also now very much a role for very personalized and very um, uh, contextual and experience led type of uh, approaches. I think um, it's, it's, it's that mix and we've got all the tools now to our disposal. And again, I hop back to that article, uh, that Economist article where it said, you know, COVID only accelerates the changes that we're, that, that we're already in the making. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, holograms, robotics, all these type of things. It's, 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 it's time for that. And in our, in our specific industry, it's data and creativity that needs to come together. You know, whether you are running an emotive-led campaign, um, you can slice and dice that differently to the various community with different passion points. And how do you do that? And so I think, yeah, I, for me, it's not an either or. I always have a little bit of a, a challenge with these either or questions because uh, it depends on, uh, on the moment, depends on the brand, depends on where you are. And as George has said, you know, they're making a very conscious choice to go um, and focus on their big brands and well, you know, their big brands have very defined brand territories. I think uh, their challenge now probably is to make sure is that brand territory now contextualized in the right way for this time. Um, and, you know, that will, the answer to that will not just be a motive line. I'm just, I'm just building on that, um, uh, I mean, I think there's a, there's a real danger as well. Uh, the brands, you know, to they're not be true to what their tone of voice, I think brands need to be true to what their tone of voice. If you're not a overly empathetic brand, then don't start being empathetic. You know, there's a, you might have, you might have seen the same reel as I have about all the, the different brands that have been reeling out, particularly in the US, of these empathetic messages, Nissan, Uber, here to help, we're here in this together. And they're, they're not brands which are, are about, you know, you know togetherness or, or empathy. So I, I think one of the big things that we need to be clear of is, is you know, if you're an empathetic brand, like a healthcare brand, a product or a healthcare brand or a life insurance, be empathetic. But if not, then stick to what, you know, stick to the knitting, be true to what your be true to your brand purpose and be true to your brand voice. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's completely fair. Um, cool. Just, we're kind of running out of time. Conscious that everybody's probably got to get on. Um, I think, you know, George, I was going to ask everybody, I guess their one tip um, that they could pass on to, you know, we've got a range of agencies and, and brand people, media publishers, et cetera, on the call. What would be your, your one piece of advice that, they can take into their role and what they can think about moving forward as we continue to build marketing plans. What, what would you recommend doing? Um, George, you're going to stick with what you just said or? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, what I've already said before about is, you know, being really clear on what the emotional benefit of your brand is and really you know, lean into that and maximize, you know, that within all, within all, within all of your communication. That's one, one tip. And I think the other, the other tip, I think um, has already been referred to by the other panelists is, is learn from some of the changes in way, some of the effective changes in how you work, not necessarily what you do, but how you work. I think for brand managers and marketeers, there's been a radical change in the way that we're 
quickly making decisions, getting content out. And I think we can streamline the way we do things, even in a you know, pretty large organization like Coke, we can really you know, simplify the way, that, the way that we work to get, to get you know, better work out the door quicker. Dick, same question. What would be your, your one piece of advice? When I worked in China, I had this huge poster of Deng Xiaoping in my office, or in, in the hallway, and it said, black cat, white cat, I don't care which color the cat is as long as it catches mice. Um, <laughs> I had that next to a poster of Bill Birnbach who said, creativity is the best, you know, is the best tool a business can employ. And I think, you know, building up on what George just said, is that define yourself by value and not by form, what I, what I referred earlier. And, Embrace change. You know, if there's one thing, the half full part of COVID, and I know it's difficult to hear for some people, you know, we all get affected by it in some, some shape or form. But the good thing about COVID, it, it just re, it just forces you to reevaluate and, and embrace it because if you don't embrace it, you know, you re, this is a wave you can't resist, you can't hold it. So let that sink into you, embrace it, and let it filter into your muscle memory and continue having that mindset going forward, even after COVID, because there will be a time when we've conquered this and there will be a vaccine and all that type of stuff. So what, are we going to, are we going to slide back? So I always, you know, kind of like uh, ironically said, it's like, I hope COVID lasts long enough for change to really occur because we're all creatures of habit. And we like to go back to what we know. So, you know, in, in order for habits to change, you need to uh, you need to practice them for uh, for quite a while. So, yeah, no, I think that's that's great advice. I think the spot on. You know, certainly, I'd love it. we'd love to be doing this this panel session in person, but obviously we've had to adapt and evolve, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more webinars and things like that in the future. Um, finally, uh, Ferdy, any one piece of advice from yourself? I always felt like this time is a, you know, is a big reboot as, as, as Dick was alluding to, you know, I think that if I was a brand back to being a brand, I, I still feel like there's a humanity that we still can, can, can focus in on at this time. It's, there's so much, there's so, you know, people are going through some really bad times. And I think that we have to just be conscious and be very sensitive to their, to their plight. And if I was a brand, I'd be able, I'd be doing everything I can to, to be sensitive and help as much as we can, inform as much as we can, be as real as much as we can, so that it's not about selling at this point, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. It's not about selling. It's about being there for everybody. It's about helping each other. And, it, and it's kind of like a, you know, for me, it's a, it goes back to my own philosophy, and I'm, I'm a very simple guy. It's about kindness at this point. Mm. kindness is, is what's going to change this world and i think that going back to what dick is saying you know if 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 a, if a brand practices that that empathy and that kindness you'll you'll come out better in the end because people remember that people remember what their heart says now you know and at the end that's what's going to build brands during this time so i think it's important to be authentic and to be kind uh, I think that's the, uh, I think we all share that sentiment and I think both personally and professionally. So it's a very nice way to end um, and a nice kind of sentiment that we can all take into our, uh, you know, our, the rest of our days and, um, you know, as we battle through what's going on. Thank you very much for listening. Make sure you subscribe to Distillery Sessions wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please do leave us a rating and a comment. In the next episode, we'll be discussing brands pivoting in the current climate with a super lineup of industry leaders. Please do subscribe so you don't miss it.